Good morning. This morning we are joined by Marsha Skripik and we're going to talk about the war in, or how to talk about the war in the Ukraine. Marsha Forchuk Skripik is the author of over 20 books for young people. Her scrupulously researched historical fiction and narrative nonfiction focuses on refugees and war from a young person's perspective. Her books have won many honors, but her favorites are the Provincial Reader's Choice Awards, of which she has won many. Her best known book is Making Bombs for Hitler. Her newest will be Winter Kill with an expected publication date of September the 6th, 2022. So be sure to look out for that one. Marsha, we're all surrounded by news reports of what's happening in Ukraine right now, but unlike many of us, you have experience thinking about such things from a child's perspective. As an author, why is it important to write about war and young people? Um, thank you for the great question. And before we get to that question, I want to just point something out. Um, and it's uh, the country that is being attacked by Vladimir Putin right now, the name of the country is Ukraine. It's not the Ukraine. The reason that I'm pointing that out is because Russian disinformation likes to put the the in front because then it sounds like it's part of another country. It's a territory of another country. And we in the West have been guilty of always thinking it doesn't matter and words do matter. Um, so the country that I'm talking about is Ukraine and how its independence may be taken away. And now I'm going to ask if you can ask the question again, because I was so focused on that, that um, you'll need to ask the question again. <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, as I mentioned, we're surrounded by news reports of what's happening in Ukraine right now. Um, but unlike many of us, you have experience thinking about such things from a child's perspective. As an author, why is it important to write about war and young people? So there are many reasons to write about war from a young person's perspective. First off, in any classroom, you're going to have some kids who have escaped from war themselves. So when they're listening to this kind of thing, when they're listening to the news, when they're seeing clips on uh, social media, it, um, uh, you know, they have post-traumatic stress disorder. It's like they have been plunged back into what they escaped themselves. Now, even people, even kids who have not experienced that personally, their parents have, their grandparents have. Canada is a, a nation of immigrants. And so this is, it's very triggering for a lot of people to see this. And so it's important to honor those feelings. Um, but also, even if someone has never experienced war, kids think about war more than adults do. And it's because kids are big thinkers and we do ourselves a disservice if we just think that kids are interested in, in balloons and pink elephants because they're not. And it's really important to respect the intelligence of young people and to write things that they understand. And so one of the things that I suggest for parents and caregivers when they're talking to kids and they they see um, uh, their, the kids around them who are interested in this. Um, first off, adults should not doom scroll in front of young people because then you're only seeing the clips, you're seeing the, the, the worst and it's all out of context. And um, I think it's important for parents and caregivers to ask their young ones what they already know so that you can start up a dialogue. But I write about different kinds, different aspects of war, like I've written uh, First World War, Second World War, um, refugees from the Vietnam War, always from the point of view of children, because so often we hear about, um, you know, the presidents and the commanders and all that, but the people who are on the ground are families. And so what is a family made up of? It's made up of kids as well they have to know what it's like day to day to be plunged in war so that we can stop it from happening again. Hi, Marsha. So um, just one question. I think you kind of answered it a little bit there. Um, when you're researching or, and writing your books, how do you imagine children and youth react to seeing or experiencing military aggression? And how do you see these events through their eyes? 
So um, what I do when I write my books is I interview people who live through it as young people. And so I write narrative nonfiction, like my uh, Vietnamese refugee books are tr like, you know, exactly what happened. And I talk to the actual person and they give me permission to quote them. When I write about World War II or books where some of the people that I'm writing about passed away, I can't put words into their mouth and call it nonfiction because I don't have the authority to put some, some words in a person's mouth. And so that's why I write it um, as uh, fiction, but it's all true. Um, I, I'm sorry, ask the question again, the part that I didn't answer. This, I, I have to say, this is, it's a really difficult time for me. And it's a difficult time for anybody who has had family who has been killed in war, which includes myself, and also people who have an attachment to Ukraine right now because what Putin is trying to do is obliterate the country. He's wanting to kill every single man, woman, and child in Ukraine. Um, and so please bear with me. I'll answer as well as I can, but understand that this is really hard. Not a problem. Uh, so the other part of the question was, um, how do you see these events through um, the children's eyes? So I'm going to use the example of Adrift at Sea, which is my book about Tuan, uh, who escaped from uh, Saigon after the fall of um, Saigon. Uh, he escaped Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. And so I interviewed him and he told me what it was like as a six-year-old. So the things that he remembered as a six-year-old is what I focused on. And in my books, that is what I focus on, is just the things that children perceive as children. So it's not getting into the politics of it. It's getting into what it's like on the ground. But the other thing that you can focus on is um, how people come together. It's not all dark. There's When, when you're talking about escape and refuge and um, uh, f even fighting back, and if you look at what's happening in Ukraine right now, there are so many things that the world has to be proud of because... Putin is a bully and people in Ukraine are uh, victims. So are the people of Russia victims because they don't agree with this war either. There've already been more than 7,000 people in Russia put in prison for protesting the war. So for kids, they need to know what it's like to be on the ground because they're already imagining it. Like don't kid yourself that, that young people don't think about this all the time. So it's important that we're honest with young people. And that's what I write from honesty. I don't put, I don't, I don't make it up. I look it up in my books because I deeply respect a young reader. But at the same time, I make sure to infuse hope because that is reality. So if you look at what's happened around the world is that people, countries have stepped up all over the world to help Ukraine. Now, they can't completely help Ukraine because that would escalate the war, but they're doing as much as they can. People are pouring in um, uh, food, clothing, uh, ammunition. Uh, borders are opening up to take ref refugees. Uh, there are people standing on the border with signs that say, I can take two people in my car right now. And the people who are leaving Ukraine right now are mothers with their children because the husbands and the fathers and the sons are staying to fight. Um, kids need to see that and take inspiration from that. And when I have readers contact me after reading a book like Making Bombs for Hitler, which was about a young Ukrainian girl who was captured at age eight and forced to work for her enemy to the point that she was making bombs that would kill her own family and, and country people. Um, what I get back from kids is that they really appreciate their own freedom by reading about what other people had to um, deal with, that they will never take for granted that they get a meal on the table again, that even though they might, might argue with their sister, they're so glad that their sister is not plunged in war. 
So this is why it's so important to run for right for young people and for young people's fears to be respected because it all comes down to how a person reacts to the world. And we want to raise our young people to be compassionate. And so to be able to do that, to raise young people with compassion and empathy, we have to be honest with them and show that there are bullies in the world. And the way that you change the world is to stand up to bullies. Now, the world is standing up to bullies. How can a young person stand up to bullies? And there are ways. And one way is to inform yourself. So to read about the context of what happened in the past can help you understand the present. It really can, like not to be in a bubble where you're not paying attention because we need to learn from this so that it doesn't happen again. Also, young people need to understand that there are people in their classroom right now who are suffering more than they are because maybe, maybe, you know, one, one kid has never experienced war, but they don't know what the person beside them has experienced. So when we talk about this war and we read about other wars, we also have to think of the people who are right among us, who are silent heroes and also silent refugees, because you cannot judge a person by what you see on the outside. You don't know the suffering about what they're going on in the inside. And see, that's the big problem with Vladimir Putin. I don't think that there's anything on the inside at all. I don't think that, you know, we don't want to create people like that. We want to create people who have empathy and care and love for the person sitting beside them as much as they care for themselves. Okay, great. Uh, this is not the first generation of children to grow up with wars and distressing world events. What is new though, is how this generation of young people are accessing and consuming news and world events. So as an author, this is a two part question. As an author writing for young readers, how do you decide what to include? And do you worry about graphic or vivid details? So um, adults think children are fragile and there are fragile children, but kids have this tendency um, in many ways to self filter. So they can often um, understand and read things beyond what adults give them credit for. The other thing that happens, and I just find this in uh, my own interaction with young people, is when they read something like uh, Making Bonds for Hitler, for example, or um, Traitors Among Us, which is my most recent book that actually deals with two young people who are captured by the Soviets after World War II and taken. Um, they understand more and what they don't understand, they filter out. But having said that, that doesn't mean that we get a free pass to give kids everything. Uh, I think that it's really wise for parents to read the books that they let their kids read because they know their kids better than anyone else. It doesn't matter what the grade level is, doesn't matter anything else. They should read together. And it's also a really good idea to discuss together. It doesn't really, kids of all ages love to be read to aloud, even, even chapter books. So this is a really good time right now to choose a book that's set during another war and read it out loud and discuss it. Because then you will see the, the, um, the understanding level that your young person is at. And I think that they'll blow you away because oftentimes they know more than you do about these subjects. Um, but what I put in a book, I will never diminish the people who have suffered so what I mean by that is the reason that I write for young people is because I plunge myself into that young person in war. So I'm not going to write anything that makes that young person an object of scorn or of criticism, because if you were plunged in war, what would, what would you do? And that's who, what my character is doing. Um, and something, one reason that I write for young people and not adults is because I, I think a lot of adult books do this thing where um, they take the victim and they make them a device in the plot. So, you know, like a detective novel starts with a dead body 
And all anyone is interested in is solving the murder rather than having compassion for the person who died. I'm not interested in that. I'm all about the compassion and I find that young people are too. But I do include a lot. Um, so I include things that really happened, but in a way that kids can handle it. As an example, in making bombs for Hitler, one of the things that the Nazis did was to draw blood from uh, young Ukrainians um, and send it to the front to be transfused to German soldiers. And they took so much blood that it killed the kids. Um, so I don't, there's no scene like that. But what there is a scene of is another slave laborer who has to work in the hospital. And then later she, she sees um, Lida, the main character in Making Bombs for Hitler. And Lida no, notices that she has blood on her cuff. So that's how we find out. And then later they're in the bathroom together and um, the girl, Yulia is scrubbing her cuff frantically to get the blood off. And she tells her what she saw, but we don't see it because I'm not going to make those children and what they suffered an object for someone else's um, entertainment. So that's why um, books for young people and writers for young people uh, uh, need to be really careful about how they frame information so that it's not upsetting, but it's still accurate. Right, and um, so my next question here is, you write fiction, but important details are based on historical fact. Do you worry about misinformation that children or their parents may not have the tools to recognize propaganda or fake news? Okay, so that's a two part question because first off, my historical fiction, because I write about Ukraine and there's no other children's writer, actually there's really not very many commercial writers at all that write um, novels set in Ukraine. It's been ignored totally. Um, so because it's such an unknown topic by the general public, I do not make anything up. So my books may be called historical fiction, but when I hand in the manuscript to my publisher, Every single incident that is in my book happened, and I prove it because I've got footnotes to academic studies, dissertations, uh, primary documents, interviews, archival material, everything. So there's nothing made up. The characters are composites of real people. They have to be because so many of them were killed. So I can't interview someone when they're dead, but I can honor them. And so I take a little bit of one person, a little bit of another, and I wrap them into a created character, but everything in my books is accurate. In terms of what parents can believe and what kids can believe, uh, there is one of the most powerful tools that um, comes from both China and Russia is disinformation. And what um, bully governments, governments that are um, uh, run by dictatorships. So they're just by definition bullies. What they like to do is to show that democracies fail. And so when you see um, protests on either side, you know, one group screaming and then the other group screaming back at them, this is all a product of propaganda, disinformation that comes from both Russia and China because they want to make free countries look like they fail. Um, so it's, and also even if you Google something, like that is, that's not research. It's not research. The first page, the first several pages, they're ads and they're also propaganda. If you look at Wikipedia, it's not accurate. It's whoever has the most money and bots to change it, they will keep on changing it. So, um, the way that you find information is to go to a credible news source that you actually pay for. Because the thing is, is if you don't pay for the news, then you are being bought. So read the Globe and Mail, read McLean's magazine, read the New York Times, but pay for it. And if you pay for it, then you're more likely to get the truth. In terms of Ukrainian news. There's this one newspaper that I would highly recommend that you pay for. Let me just get it. It's the Kiev Independent. So that's 
K-Y-I-V, independent, dot com. You can subscribe. You can also read some free before you do that, but it would help Ukrainians get actual true information out if you could take it upon yourself to subscribe to that newspaper. Um, but that's how you get true information is by actually paying for a newspaper instead of just scrolling um, Twitter or Facebook or any kind of social media, because that is just, I'm sorry, it's crap. Mm -hmm. And we do have access to magazines like McLean and um, the Globe and Mail at the library as well. You can get it online. You can come in as well. Public libraries are the bastion of uh, free speech and free information. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of different viewpoints too. And so you can sort of make up your mind. If you're reading all these different viewpoints, you can kind of make up your mind um, through these sources. Yes, I, I pay for a whole pile of newspapers online because I don't like to drag them down to the in my blue box, but I, I pay for them. And I like to read as many points of view as I can for the exact reason that you say. Um, my next question, I think you've already touched on it, um, encouraging children to explore their own thoughts about war. So my follow-up question to that would, would be, do you ever encourage children to write their own stories, uh, either based on their own experiences or imagining what it might be like to experience war firsthand? Yes. And a lot of kids will ask me when I do presentations, why do you write about war? And I tell them because I want to know how a regular person acts in a time that is extraordinary. And I also ask them when I'm doing presentations, I, I say, think of a time that was really difficult for you and put yourself into that position and write about it. But also talk to your parents and grandparents neighbors, someone that you know came from someplace else, and find out what it was like for them at your age. Do an interview with them and think about writing it. Because, you know, the only way that we can really understand what someone else is going through is to let ourselves step into their shoes and walk in their life for a little bit. And that's how you build compassion. And, you know, it's not about us and them. We're all us and we're all them but you actually have to ask and you can't assume and when you see someone walking down the street maybe someone to you who looks snobby or whatever or maybe you just don't like them because they seem to have everything that you don't have or maybe they you know whatever maybe they punched you you can talk to them and they may have different ideas about what you did to them too so the whole thing is to talk and to explore and to not assume and you can write about things, you can sit down and write about things that matter to you in times that you feel that you are in war, but talk to other people and see if you can find someone who actually lived through that or had to leave behind their home because of a war situation. Um, so do you have any advice for parents, teachers, and other caregivers and helping children navigate the current situation? I do. One of the things is, is just ask your young person what they already know, because they all have been talking to their friends about it. And they may have um, like way too much information about certain parts and not context. So if you open up a dialogue, then that helps. But you know, adults also probably don't know a lot of things. And so it's important for adults who have not been paying attention to the situation to educate themselves so that they know, for example, if their kid asks them, what's NATO? Find out, find out what NATO is so that you can talk to your kids that way. What's the European Union? Find out, uh, what, where is Russia? Where is Ukraine? Show them on the map, but also show them how far away it is from Canada because that will help, because they see that this is happening on the other side of the world. Not that that means that you don't worry about it, but um, kids can, can think that a war will start in their backyard when they're scrolling social media. Um, 
So it's really important to give context, but also based on reality. So it's really important for um, adults to educate themselves. Something else too, and this has been going on forever, is that there has been misinformation about what Ukraine is forever. And I mean, hundreds of years. So you'll hear um, uh, Russian disinformation and before that Soviet disinformation, that Ukraine isn't its own country and that, uh, that Russia and Ukraine were the same country in ancient times. And it's just simply not true. Ukraine predates Russia by a very long time. And um, in you know hundreds of years ago, Ukraine um, was civilized. They had reading and writing. Uh, they had uh, a, a culture. And what is now Russia was called um, Muscovy. And they, it was a, they took over what is now Ukraine, but they also co-opted their history because they wanted to have a noble history. So the, the whole idea of Rus and Kievan Rus and this ancient history and all that, it was never Russia's in the first place. They even took that from Ukraine. So they took their history, but also during World War II, um, everybody referred to the Soviet Union as Russia, when actually what the Soviet Union was, was all of the captured nations around Russia, plus Russia, and all of them were under a dictatorship of Stalin, who was just like Hitler and just like Putin. And so a lot of, when you read old stuff, they'll talk about Russia did this. And one, one big lie was that Russia in World War II lost 20 million people. Sorry, never happened, didn't happen. The people who died in World War II were mostly of the captured nations because guess who Stalin pushed out in front to get killed first in World War II. So there are lots of big lies out there to make us not understand the current situation. And what Putin wants to do right now is to kill the people who live in Ukraine and replace them with people that he thinks um, will like him better. But the thing is, is that Russians don't like Putin any better than Ukrainians do. It's just that they are already his prisoners. Okay, I will admit that I'm not the best in geography. Maybe you are. Um, I can't imagine just packing up my belongings and and evacuating the area. And I know I saw uh, Lisa Leflam from CTV News uh, reporting from Poland. So I just wondered, can you just tell us maybe some of the countries right surrounding it that people might be escaping to, and maybe. So Moldova is one of the poorest countries in Europe, and they have opened their doors to Ukrainians. Uh, Romania, same thing. Poland, those are the countries that can mostly, because they're right on the borders. And Belarus is also on the border, but they're fighting with Russia. So Ukraine and uh, uh, has like, you know, a huge border with Russia and Belarus. And then they also have a huge border with European countries. So um, all the countries in Europe are really close together, right? It's hard for Canadians to understand just how close they are. Uh, but like it's a 10 hour, I think it's a 10 hour car drive from uh, Lviv in Western Ukraine to um, Germany. Like it's not that far, but they couldn't get there because like there's you know, such a clump and cluster of people, like it's just this congestion along the borders. But the countries, the Eastern European countries that are butting right up against the edges um, of Ukraine are all doing everything that they can to help the women and children who are escaping because the men are staying to fight. Canadian um, uh, Canadians of Ukrainian heritage are also going to Ukraine right now to fight as well for their homeland. It's just stunning. Um, so there have been, a, I think about 650,000 refugees so far. And, uh, you know, people are just picking them up in their cars once they get across the border and taking them to their own homes because this is all just happening so quickly. 
That's also what I was going to ask if you knew how many people, but 650,000 is quite a, a number. Well, it, it is a number, but it also means that there are that many other people who uh, haven't managed to escape. And the other thing that happens is um, like uh, social media connections have been taken out by the Russians. So people in Ukraine often can't get their stories out. Uh, and um, that just makes it so difficult too. And so there are many uh, people who are uh, in Ukraine, women and children, young people, um, elderly people who are stuck there. And um, Putin is bombing residential areas. He bombed a, camp, a children's cancer hospital. Just stop that set in your mind for a minute. This is, there's never been something like this before. The, the magnitude of what that person, if I can call him a person, is doing is just astonishing. The, and it's evil. The other thing too, is that I want to clarify that Russian people are not the enemy. They are not the enemy. They are victims of Putin and they're his first victims. And they have been coming out in droves to try and protest. And when they protest, they are arrested and put in jail. And then they keep on protesting. And then those ones are arrested and they keep on being put in jail. And a lot of the reasons why Vladimir Putin is doing this is because his biggest opponent, his name is Alexei Navalny, is in prison right now and is on trial. And Putin would like to execute him. So what he's doing is he's bombing his neighbor to take attention away from what he's doing in his own country to um, eliminate, to erase his own opposition. So I would hope that everybody who is watching this or listening would please find out about Navalny, N-A-L-V-A-L-N-Y. Alexei Navalny, because you're not even hearing news stories about that. But this is what it's all about, is Putin trying to save his own backside by killing as many people as he can. My late mother-in-law, Lydia Skripuk, was a young girl during World War II, and her house was occupied by the Nazis. And just as they were losing the war, she said, the Nazis became like angry bees, even though they knew that they would die by stinging. They just stung everybody. And that was the hardest time for her and her parents to escape because before they were occupied, they were prisoners in their own house. But at the very end, the Nazis were just going wild, shooting and killing and slaughtering everyone that they saw. And that's exactly what Putin is doing now. Elena, do you have another question? Um, actually, um, actually, just your opinion. Do you, um, what do you, how do you see this playing out in the long? Do you think um, the West is going to intervene at some point? Where do you see that it might be going? So if the West doesn't intervene um, and Putin isn't punished, then we will be in World War III. There's just no other thing. And I'm sorry, but that's the truth. Uh, I don't know what the solution is, but this is a very grave situation. Uh, the world has stepped up like never before. I don't know whether they have stepped up far enough. What I also hope is that um, the people who surround Putin uh, are the ones that uh, deal with the situation. But also China uh, is the only country that really has a friendship with both Russia and Ukraine. Uh, China has invested more in Ukraine than any other country. And so they are in a position to um, get Putin to step back. And hopefully that will happen because the alternative is unthinkable. This is, this is, this is, beyond anything that we have dealt with in the history 
of humanity. Marcia, your next book, Winter Kill, is due out in September. How will that book resonate with readers after the events of this year? So Winter Kill is about the last time Stalin tried to obliterate Ukraine. So the last time a mad dictator tried to erase a country. Um, so I'm doing the copy edits of it right now, the page proof. So it looks like the pages look like what's in the book, but it's on a grid so that I can find little typos. And it's like watching the news because what happened between 1930 and 1933 was that the mad dictator of uh, the Soviet Union, but he really wanted like he was a Russian nationalist, even though he was ethnically Georgian. Um, he wanted to kill Ukrainians because he wanted the land, but he didn't like Ukrainians because they liked democracy too much. So what he did is he stationed soldiers around the perimeter of the country of Ukraine, if you can imagine this, and then removed the food and then shot anyone who tried to cross the border. There were so many millions who were starved to death at that time that we can't count it because he also then killed the statisticians who are doing the counting to suppress. So the estimates range from 3 million to 10 million who were starved to death. After they did that, um, the empty villages were repopulated with people from Belarus and Russia. Those ancestors of the people who replaced Ukrainians are now fighting for Ukraine. They don't want to be part of Putin's Russia because even though they came at that time, they preferred to be in a free Ukraine, even though their beginnings were so horrific. What my book is about is about a boy. Uh, his name is Neil, actually named after my son, Neil, um, who is plunged in the midst of this and doesn't understand because they're calling it the beginning of the five-year plan. And they're saying, we're going to industrialize the countryside and we need your wheat to pay for steel. And so it, it comes up slowly. And it's sort of like you put, take a frog and you put them into lukewarm water and then you turn the, the water you know, the, the, uh, the, the stove on and you start to boil. And that's what it was like for Ukrainians. And it's the same kind of thing what happened now with Putin because the war in Ukraine right now has been going on since 2013. It's just that the world kind of ignored it. But I, my book is about a young person plunged at that time, but there is also a, a girl based on a real girl who is uh, Canadian. And she and her father went over to help Stalin because they were idealists and they thought that the five-year plan sounded like a really good idea. And when they got over there, they realized that they were complicit in a genocide. And so the story is about Alice from Canada, who's based on a real girl and her father is based on a real guy who did that, a real father who went there and Neil, and he is um, based on many, many people who went through that and how they deal with this and what they do to try and change the situation and the, the small bit that they are able to do in those circumstances. And it's called Winter Kill because when you're starving, you can find food, even if it means eating a tiny little seed by digging. Um, but in winter, there's just nothing left. And so it started in 1930 and it went actually till 1934, but 32, 33 were the most horrible years. But each winter is when the huge waves of deaths happened. Um, and now look, we're in the middle of winter and in Ukraine right now, it's winter kill right now. I, I think that my book will give young people context because it shows just this deep hate of the people who, um, the mad dictators who tend to control Russia and their deep hate of Ukraine. And the reason that they hate Ukraine is because Ukrainians love democracy. The K Ukrainian national anthem, the first line of it is, Ukraine is not yet dead. 
think of that. So this is a national anthem forever because, because they have been beside this nation that has tried to kill them over the centuries. To even have that as the first line of your national anthem really takes something. Now, I, I want to give kids some ideas about what they can do. One thing that would really help is even collect 25 cents. If you, if you get you know, an allowance and you can spare a loony or 25 cents, you can take it to the local Red Cross on 25 William Street and they're collecting money for Ukraine. And the Canadian government is matching that money. That's the easiest thing for a young person in Brantford to be able to do. But the other thing is, think about wearing the colors of Ukraine. And that's yellow and blue. And the reason for that is because you can go outside and you can be walking down the street. And if you've got this on, then people know without you saying anything that you believe that people should be allowed to live in their own country and walk down their own street without a bomb killing them. It's a simple thing to do, but it speaks volumes. The other thing to do is um, there's something that Ukrainians make and they're, they're, they're Easter eggs. Um, so they're, they're eggs and they're called pisanki, P-Y-S-A-N-K-Y. Um, and that means written eggs. And on the eggs are written wishes and prayers. And I wanna show you two that I've made since this started. Here is one. And you'll see I've used those colors. And this is my hope is this is, this is sunlight or a star. And this is another one. But you can go to YouTube and you can find out, just Google, you know, Pysanky, P-Y-S-A-N-K-Y, or how to make Ukrainian Easter eggs. And you can make these and you can take pictures of them and you can send them to people in Ukraine. You can send them to me and I will show them. And it, it just shows that you're in solidarity. But there's this, this um, folk tale about Ukrainian Easter eggs, about Pysanky. And I'm pronouncing that wrong because I am Canadian and I was born here. And so I mangle the language. Um, but the, 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 the folk tale about um, Ukrainian Easter eggs is as long as there are people making Ukrainian Easter eggs, the world will continue. The world will continue to live. So this is a very important thing as long as as long as you do this and we all do this, then it is a symbol of hope, not just for Ukrainians, but for the whole world. And you, I, you know, if you don't have eggs in your refrigerator, I think probably you can get them fairly simply. They're not that expensive. And you can get dye and you can do them and you can make the implement even out of tin foil. Like if you've got a pie plate, you can make it and you can tape it to the bottom of a uh, pencil, and you can make these. So this is what I would suggest. It's something that you can do. You can donate a loony or even 25 cents to the local Red Cross for uh, Ukraine. You can make um, Ukrainian Easter eggs and you can wear yellow and blue. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, I think our time is almost up. Um, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, these are very emotional and trying times. Um, I'd just like to thank you. Uh, Atlanta, do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, thank you, Marsha. Um, it's very informative. And actually, you know, just one quick thing. I was wondering your opinion on sort of the bravery we've seen coming out of Ukraine as well, right? Uh, with the president himself taking up arms and just your average citizens trying their best. What is your opinion on that? And how important do you think it is to elevate those voices? It's very important to elevate those voices. And thank you for asking this question because this is what Ukrainians have always had to be because they have been attacked for so many centuries. 
So what um, President Zelensky is doing is following in the tradition of what Ukrainians have been doing. And um, I actually wrote another book about the underground in World War II, because in World War II, civilians did the same thing that they're doing now. I'm sure that we've all seen the, the, the pictures of grandmothers going out and standing in front of tanks and trying to hold them with their bare hands coming forward. But in World War II, the same thing was happening. So you had barefooted um, country farmers who lived in the mountains who would uh, uh, take, kill a Nazi, take their gun and defend their village. They had village patrols every place, but they also weren't protecting them only from the Nazis. Because if you take a look at where Ukraine is, it's on the border of Europe and Russia now. In World War II, it had Nazis on one side, Soviet Union on the other. The Soviets were trying to kill Ukrainians. The Nazis were trying to kill Ukrainians because this is the other big lie that, the, that Putin tells about Ukrainians. He says, they're Nazis. No, actually Nazis were trying to kill Ukrainians almost as frequent, frequently as they were trying to kill Jews. Ukrainians were considered subhuman. They were considered the slave race. And so because no one in, in, in World War II was fighting for Ukrainians, they took up arms and fought themselves. They had hospitals built underground. So what Zelensky is doing and the heroism that he is showing is exactly what Ukrainians have always been doing. And the book that it's The War Below um, and also published as Underground Soldier, um, the book that I'm talking about that I wrote about um, the brave thing that happened before and it's in the library. Uh, and it came out ironically at the time of the Euromaidan revolution which was when all of this stuff happened. And so what happened in 2013 and 2014, like just be December, January, was Putin had put in a puppet president in Ukraine. Um, and then people were so angry at this puppet president because he was basically abusing people. And they went to the streets and ousted him. And they actually kicked him out of the country and then elected their own government. Only, I don't know of anyone else who has done this kind of thing over and over again because Ukrainians are so fierce for democracy. Fierce for democracy. They would rather die than be under the thumb of a dictator. I am so proud of Zelensky and his wife and his children. And I am so proud of every single grandmother and just innocent person who was trying to hold back tanks with their bare hands. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, Chris, anything, any wrapping comments? No, let's just hope for a speedy recovery to this or a speedy ending to this, these atrocities. Uh, again, thank you, Marcia. Um, been very informative and thank you for all your honest comments and responses. Thank you for doing this. Um, I really appreciate um, being given a voice. Thank you and goodbye everyone. Bye everyone.